the most important, heavily extrapolated and explored of Butler's ideas that are raised in the Dune series is that of machine evolution. It was this concept from his initial letters to the Christchurch Press in the form of Darwin Among the Machines that Butler would later elaborate upon in Erewhon, eventually comprising the majority of the section entitled The Book of the Machines. Butler's satirical discussion of machines superseding humanity by means of Darwin's theory of natural selection is now considered to be the first work that looked at what is today referred to as technological singularity. Humanity's subjugation by machines that have evolved and superseded them due to technological singularity has become a prominent theme in science fiction literature and films alike, the most notable of recent examples being the Wachowski Brothers Matrix trilogy and the Terminator franchise. In Erewhon, it is the idea that Butler presented of a society where most advanced machinery has been destroyed that would greatly influence Frank Herbert. H.G. Wells' novel The War of the Worlds projects elements of social Darwinism into the future and portrays the Martians as a super evolved form of humanity. In fact, the Martians represent Wells' ideas as to the potential future evolution of mankind, one million years down the evolutionary timescale. The Martians are what mankind will eventually become. In Erewhon, Butler takes a similar attitude, but takes Darwin's ideas of evolution and natural selection and applies them to the machinery developed since the Industrial Revolution. The conclusion that the Erewhonians come to is that one day machine evolution will eventually supersede that of human evolution, and mankind will be overtaken by a machine culture and eventually enslaved by it. The result of this hypothesis in Erewhon is that the inhabitants of this seemingly perfect society eventually revolt against complex machinery, blindly destroying such technological items so as to prevent this possible future from occurring. There is no security, to quote his own words, against the ultimate development of mechanical consciousness in the fact of machines possessing little consciousness now. In Erewhon, the three chapters of the Book of the Machines examine this attitude to the destruction of such technology. This philosophy is explained to the novel's protagonist, Higgs, who himself has carried a piece of machinery into Erewhon, namely his watch. Possession of this watch results in Higgs's early arrest shortly after arriving in Erewhon. Butler provides two viewpoints to this presentation of pseudo-Luddite behaviour. The first of these is based entirely on the premise of the evolution and supersedence of machinery over humanity. Mankind's fate in this foreseen future is perceived by the Erewhonians as being not altogether bad, but is nonetheless one of slavery. Their prediction however views this servitude on a par with the human domestication of livestock and pets. They say that although man should become to the machines what the horse and dog are to us, yet he will continue to exist, and will probably be better off in a state of domestication under the beneficent rule of the machines than in his present wild condition. Butler's responding argument given by another philosophical writer who remains nameless puts forward the concept that humanity uses machinery in a form of symbiotic mergence with the flesh, that machinery is very much an extension of mankind itself, and can be seen as a form of supplementary limb. Because of this, the view presented by the philosopher indicates that human civilization and the development of machinery advance hand in hand. As Higgs informs the reader, the author tells him that machines were to be regarded as a part of man's own physical nature, being really nothing but extracorporeal limbs. Man, he said, was a machinate animal. The response that prevails in the Erewhonian society is one of blind preemptive action where the choice is made to destroy all machines to prevent this possible evolution of machinery beyond that of humanity. Butler's work is very much a product of its times, as is the tendency with most utopian satires, and its attitude towards machinery comes from Butler's amused speculations on applying natural selection to the emerging prevalence of machinery and industrialization in Victorian times. In fact, it is in the Erewhonian's attitudes and blind acceptance that Butler's utopian satire particularly bites, and it is here where we see these themes carried on by Herbert. In Erewhon, the interesting thing is that the philosopher who instructs Higgs on the possibility of a future nightmare for mankind as slaves to the machines, 
predicts that an evolution to this state of affairs may not happen for 20,000 years or even 100,000 years. But this, in terms of the evolutionary time scale, is a mere moat compared to the length of time it has taken humanity to evolve. Complex now, but how much simpler and more intelligibly organised may it not become in another 100,000 years, or in 20,000? For man at present believes that his interest lies in that direction. He spends an incalculable amount of labour and time and thought in making machines breed always better and better. It is out of mankind's desire to continually refine and make better the machines that are as Butler saw it, intrinsically linked to our development as a species, that leads to the eventual Butlerian Jihad in June. This event is extrapolated by Frank Herbert along a similar timescale as Butler's prediction of when this technological revolt may occur. Herbert proceeds from the assumption that these machines did evolve in a similar timescale, and then demonstrates humanity's desperate response to machine dominance, the Butlerian Jihad, as an event that changes human society forever, ultimately altering its evolutionary path. The response of the Butlerian Jihad is perhaps quite rational and predictable, but the Imperium of the Dune Universe's subsequent actions appear as irrational as the world of the Erewhonians. The evolution of machines and technology, especially that of artificial intelligence, many years in the past of the events in Dune, became the nexus that created the Butlerian Jihad. This event caused humanity to alter the fabric of society in the Imperium to direct evolution itself, down numerous paths that are essentially established by the schools of thought such as the Guild, the Bene Gesserit, the Suk, and the Mentats. These schools, although not exclusively, seek to replace the dependency on thinking machines with their spheres of influence in higher mathematics, politics, medicine, and logic respectively. The religious edicts and dogma of the Great Convention, the CET, and the OC Bible, directed against the development of complex and intelligent machinery, seeking to cement this in the society of the re-emerging Imperium by making the construction of such machines a mortal sin. Herbert's approach by extrapolating Butler's ideas allows him to shape the Imperium into an atavistic and feudal society. However, within this society, there still remain many complex machines in use, within different areas of technology. Frank Herbert, in presenting his viewpoint of the double-edged nature of technological dependence, demonstrates this in June by the way such technologies create specific problems to their users, which help to maintain a standoffish nature to their applications. This in turn helps to perpetuate the atavistic nature of technology under the prescriptions of the Butlerian Jihad and the Great Convention within the Imperium. A number of societies within the Imperium specialise in specific technologies that come close to violating the accords created by the Butlerian Jihad, including those of Riches, Ix, and the Bene Tleilax. The Ixians, however, are predominant in the later books of the series in the re-emergence and development of machine technologies. A good early example of Ixian technology is the various devices that are created and rely upon the use of what is called the Holtzman effect. The little explained Holtzman effect in the Dune series is an underlying scientific principle which provides the basis for a number of technologies. These range from the shields used by individuals, buildings and ships, and even the engines that power the guild highliners when they fold space, to the use of suspensors utilised in glow globes and other devices such as hunter seekers. Herbert describes the use of a number of Holtzman effect devices in the terminology of the Imperium Appendix to Dune, and one such example is the defensive shield. Shield, defensive. The protective field produced by a Holtzman generator. This field derives from phase 1 of the suspensor nullification effect. A shield will permit entry only to objects moving at slow speeds, depending on setting, this speed ranges from 6 to 9 cm per second, and can be shorted out only by a shire sized electric field. These personal shields are often used in an emergency as a last line of personal defence, and we see Paul, 
in the beginning of June, being trained in the use of shield and knife. The shields create a technological conundrum for those who use them. In the case of personal defence, they are useful up to the point where they can stop fast moving projectile weapons and speedily used melee and missile weapons. However, the veritable standoff that is presented when using technologically advanced weapons is curious. If a LAS gun connects with the Holtzman field of a shield, the interaction creates subatomic fusion, which results in a nuclear explosion. For this reason, advanced weapons such as LAS guns are what Herbert calls limited in a field generator shield culture. Members of the houses of the Landsrad and their households sometimes wear such shields, but the main way to safely assault someone wearing such an item is by using a knife. Hence the resulting evolution in technologies creates a return to the most basic of primitive weapons and tactics. Holtzman shields are seldom used on Arrakis, except outside of fortifications and buildings within the shield wall and in towns such as Arakeen. In the desert, shields are tantamount to suicide, as the vibrations of a shield that uses the Holtzman effect have the almost immediate result of attracting every worm in the vicinity to the wearer. The worms of Arrakis are attracted to and travel towards rhythmic vibrations, including those created by human footsteps. To avoid attracting the worms in the open desert, the Fremen walk without rhythm, and when they need to travel a great distance, they summon worms with the use of a thumper in order to ride the great beasts. The irony is not lost upon us that House Atreides is laid low by their reliance and dependency on the shield generators in Arakeen, which are sabotaged by a Harkonnen agent. In the conclusion of Dune, Paul uses his family atomics to breach the shield wall of Arakeen, letting the desert and the worms in to deal with the Harkonnen and the Emperor's Sardaukar. The final confrontation between Paul and his enemies is a moment of uncertainty in his prescience, but his triumph and rise to the position of Emperor is ultimately brought about by his skill with the Chris knife, made from the tooth of a dead sandworm. Again, Herbert shows us that in his universe where the simplest technologies in the hands of those whose minds have been trained to use them, prevail against those who have dependency on technology and let their minds and skills falter. The other major use of the Holtzman field is in the application of space travel used to create the Holtzman drive which powers the enormous Guild Highliners. The Guild represents by far the most severe of the biological evolutionary developments brought about as a direct result of the Butlerian Jihad. The huge Highliners use their Holtzman drive engines to fold space, allowing them to travel between worlds without moving, and the guild's monopoly on space travel is such that the imperial calendar is based on their foundation. Prior to the development of guild navigators and steersmen, space travel was accomplished by using advanced computers to work out the complex mathematical calculations required for travelling the vast distances of the Imperium safely. With the advent of the Butlerian Jihad, such machines are forbidden, and the Guild as a school of thought focuses almost entirely on mathematics. As a result, the Guild soon develops their own navigators able to perform the incredibly complex calculations required for space travel. Unfortunately for the Guild, this level of mathematical ability requires a limited form of prescience, presumably because of the nature of galactic drift, and in order to accomplish this, they live in tanks which are immersed in the drug melange. Sufficient immersion in melange by the guild's navigators and steersmen causes massive mutation, the price they pay for interstellar travel free from the dependencies of the intelligent machinery required for such navigational feats. This freedom however results in complete dependency upon the drug melange, to provide the necessary degree of prescience required for space travel. It shows an inherent weakness in the guild's modus operandi, as it does with Chom, who rely on the guild for interstellar commerce. It is through the hydraulic despotism that the dependency of the Imperium for Melange has, in almost all of its social and political strata, that Paul is able to rise to prominence, using his own greater prescient abilities to seek out the pre-spice mass on Arrakis, 
and threaten to destroy it once and for all. It is this same prescience that allows Paul and later Leto II to maintain a stranglehold on all of the socio-political groups within the new imperium under Atreides' rule. Ultimately, the guild, with their limited prescience, are used to shield the conspirators from Paul and his government in Dune Messiah, and it is this development that creates another evolutionary leap in the technology of the Imperium, namely the creation of Ixian No Technology. This technology, developed over the many years that cover the later books, includes no rooms or no chambers, no globes, and eventually no ships. The purpose of no technology is essentially threefold. First and foremost, no technology is created with the direct intent of hiding its contents from someone with the ability of prescience. They do this by means of emitting and absorbing radiation in direct synchronicity to their surroundings. In addition to this, these ships, rooms, and globes are also used as storage facilities for long term preservation. It is therefore suggestive that they have anti entropic qualities within their interior. Thirdly, the Ixian No ships, which we are informed are being designed for the Guild, are probably the greatest flaunting of the prohibitions of the Butlerian Jihad, in that they ultimately have a degree of machine prescience, in order that they may be piloted without the need for a melange dependent Guild navigator. Ixian No rooms are first mentioned in God Emperor of Dune beginning with the findings of the journals of Leto II in Dar es Balat on Arrakis that we note is now called Rakis. This prelude to the beginning of what we refer to as the Second Great Dune Trilogy is presented as the initial findings of an archaeological dig, many years following the end of Leto II's three and a half thousand year long reign. Third, and we believe that this is equal in portent to the actual discovery there is the storehouse itself. The repository for these journals is an undoubted Ixian artefact of such primitive and yet marvellous construction that it is sure to throw new light on the historical epoch known as the Scattering. As was to be expected, the storehouse was invisible. It was buried far deeper than myth and the oral history had led us to expect, and it emitted radiation and absorbed radiation to simulate the natural character of its surroundings a mechanical mimesis, which is not surprising of itself. What has surprised our engineers, however, is the way this was done with the most rudimentary and truly primitive mechanical skills. Leto II's rule is characterised by the way he views himself as the ultimate predator, virtually invulnerable to attack, and the almost total completeness of his prescience does indeed make him like a god to the subjects of his empire. While many technologies are forbidden toys to his subjects, it is in part through him that certain technologies begin to flourish again. The degree of physical change he has undergone, for example, means he depends greatly on the use of a suspensor cart to travel around on. Leto II's great focal point for his own suffering is like his father before him, the curse of almost total prescience. While it is apparent that the Ixians created a no globe for him to store his legacy to the future, the Ixians also decided to attempt to use this technology against him by using a no room to bring about the creation of Hawaii Nori. Leto II had a particularly good relationship with a former ambassador to his court from the world of Ix called Malki, and Hawaii Nori is described to the god emperor as being his niece. Malki himself is described by the Bene Gesserit as a boon companion to the god emperor, and believed that he might have been genetically designed with that official context in mind. Malki was a roguish man who enjoyed the company of the emperor's fish speakers, whom he called the emperor's horai, a term which Leto II finds himself using on occasion. His roguish qualities and appeal to the god emperor seemed to come with a certain kind of wild honesty towards Leto II, sensing as he does there is little point to lying to someone who is prescient, even openly revealing Ixian secrets that the god emperor already knows, seemingly for his own amusement. The fact that Huai Nori is engineered in a sense from her uncle, suggests that the Ixians are approaching the god emperor from a psychological point of view. 
The qualities that both Huai Nori and Malki represent suggest a profiling of Leto II's personality and unique characteristics, which could well be tantamount to asking the question, what do you get someone who has everything, and in this case, also knows everything? The essential mark of Malki's and later Huai Nori's character is their ability to surprise and entertain Leto II. This harks back to the curse of prescience that afflicts Paul Atreides and later Leto II to a much greater degree. That prescience, as an evolutionary development, provides its possessor with almost total stagnation as an individual, with virtually nothing being able to surprise or entertain them. Nothing is ever new. Once again we are reminded of the influence of Samuel Butler's Erewhon on the Dune series. Of particular note is Butler's chapter, The World of the Unborn, where he discusses the Erewhonian view of time, who believed that we are drawn through life backwards, or again that we go onwards into the future as into a dark corridor. The World of the Unborn is a chapter written by Higgs, summarising the Erewhonians' attitude towards their children and is based upon a text of mythology that is presented to him by one of the professors of On Reason. Before discovering the Erewhonian attitude to the unborn, he comes across an entry on a previous race of man that existed according to their myths before the Erewhonians. The entry also notes the following. Strange fate for man, he must perish if he get that, which he must perish if he strives not after. If he strives not after it, he is no better than the brutes. If he get it, he is more miserable than the devils. Huai Nori, it seems, is also genetically designed, with Leto suspecting that Malki may even be Huai's genetic father. Leto II does however realise that Huai has been conceived inside an Ixian no room, and where he is capable of seeing just about everything with his prescience, he knows about the no room by the fact that there are certain areas he cannot look into. Huai Nori has been conceived outside of the purveyance of Leto II's prescience, for the very reason that she will be something new to him, possessing the entertaining qualities from her genetic father Malki, which the god emperor so enjoyed. She has been genetically engineered by the Ixians with the help of the Trilaxu to be the perfect companion to a being who is virtually a god, and who has a horde of companions spanning the whole of humanity within the recesses of his mind's memory. In many ways, Huai Nori as a genetic construct is similar to the first Duncan Idaho Gola, Hate, although in this case she is not a Gola. In that sense she has not been directly recreated from the tissue of a dead individual and had their memories restored, but rather is an entirely new being created with genetic elements of Malki, although in this case female, and has been educated to behave in a sophisticated manner that would ultimately appeal to Leto II. In that sense she is also a genetic development that has been created out of the necessity to attempt to overcome an almost all powerful evolutionary trait, that of prescience. This in itself has emerged from the need to evolve human beings beyond their normal abilities in order to replace the dependencies that humans had on artificial intelligence, which ultimately brought about the Butlerian Jihad. It came to Leto that if she could change places with him, take up his burden, she would offer herself. The fact that she could not do this added to her pain. She was intelligence built on profound sensitivity without any of Malki's hedonistic weaknesses. She was frightening in her perfection. Everything about her reaffirmed his awareness that she was precisely the kind of woman who, if he had grown to normal manhood, he would have wanted, no, demanded, as his mate. And the Ixians knew it. Huai's purpose is entirely to charm Leto II, and even as she informs him of this, and he acknowledges what he already knows, the sense of Leto II's prescience, having already seen all of this, is continuous with us throughout the novel. Leto II for that reason alone is one of the finest characters to be created in literature, almost perfect in his godhood and inhumanity. The intrigue to the reader comes from catching the briefest glimpses of his remaining humanity 
which has all but been sacrificed to the Golden Path. Leto II's cruelty and the role he plays as the ultimate predator, in his eyes, is to ultimately set about the necessary requirements for humanity's evolution via natural selection to allow mankind to adapt to the forthcoming extinction event. This evolutionary necessity is directed from a number of points of view, and I shall discuss these further when looking at Leto II in more detail, but in particular two of these are related to the development of Ixian technology. The no technology being developed as a means to hide someone from the prescience of Leto II, in this case Huai Nori, is a direct result of evolving technology to get around an evolutionary trait of the God Emperor's mutation, his all encompassing prescience. The God Emperor's oppression of the technological innovators such as Ix and the Bene Tylax, whilst simultaneously seeing to it that they supply him with the necessary machines he needs to accomplish the goals of his Golden Path, ensure the continual development and evolution of design within the respective cultures. The benefits of this become apparent later in the last two books of the Dune series, in that the Ixian no ships are essential to the great confrontation that is coming. The potential disasters in terms of heading back towards the society prior to the Butlerian Jihad are we think obvious to Leto II, hinting at perhaps the unseen enemy is in fact the returning thinking machines. The Ixians contemplated making a weapon, a type of hunter-seeker, self-propelled death with a machine mind, it was to be designed as a self-improving thing which would seek out life and reduce that life to its inorganic matter. I have not heard of this thing, Lord. I know that. The Ixians do not recognise that machine makers always run the risk of becoming totally machine. This is ultimate sterility. Machines always fail, given time. And when these machines failed, there would be nothing left no life at all. Simultaneously to this, the God Emperor himself is continuing with his own form of the Bene Gesserit's breeding program, where he breeds Atreides stock for a very specific reason. He also has a tendency to breed his Duncan Idaho Golas, of which there have been many over the previous three and a half thousand years since the original hit. The end result is not to create more Kwisatz Haderachs, but in fact to develop a human who is genetically resistant to the scrying abilities of those with prescience. The first human who is capable of doing this is an Atreides Skyon called Siona, the daughter of Leto II's major domo and also a result of the God Emperor's Atreides breeding program. The ultimate push of his predatory tactics in shaping human beings and technology are the Atreides who are bred with a genetic immunity to those who have prescience, and the Ixian no ships, which can hide those within from prescience, and can also use a limited form of machine prescience to travel without a navigator. Hence, finally ending the guild's 13,000 year monopoly on space travel. After the Ixians and the Riches, of whom we hear little of in the Dune series, the next technically proficient race of humans in the Imperium is the Bene Tleilax, also known as the Tleilaxu. The Tleilaxu's knowledge of technology is not as machine oriented to the degree of the Ixians, and instead follows the paths of machine-human interface, together with technologies involved with genetic manipulation, cloning and mimicry. In the appendix on the terminology of the Imperium in Dune, we are given a reference to the planet Tleilax, described as the lone planet of Thalum, noted as a renegade training centre for Mentats, source of Twisted Mentats. Their main purpose in Dune is to provide the Baron Harkonnen with his Twisted Mentat, Pyder de Vries, who we are able to later deduce is in fact a Gola. Apart from this, the Tleilaxu are barely mentioned in the first Dune novel and it is not until Dune Messiah that we begin to take real notice of them as very dangerous members of the conspiracy against Paul and his family. As the series progresses, the Tleilaxu become one of the most dominant political players in the Imperium, 
and the technologies which they develop and evolve over the course of the novel's timeline are of fundamental importance to the story. The Tleilaxu technologies, however, represent a double-edged sword, and the true nature of the dirty Tleilaxu, as they are derogatorily known, remains a great mystery, as does the nature of Tleilaxu females. The first real instance of the Tleilaxu operating within the political machinations of the Empire is early in Dune Messiah when we hear them described as scientific amoralists who use face dancer disguises. Face dancers are a lower caste of Tleilaxu society and the equivalent of a human chameleon, in that they possess the ability to mimic other individuals, changing their height, weight, skin colouring, and even their voices to imitate almost perfectly the individual they have targeted. Skytail, the Tleilaxu member of the conspiracy against Paul and his family in Dune Messiah, is one of these face dancers, the one that possesses a greater degree of intelligence and autonomy than most of these engineered creatures that we encounter in the series. The Bene Tleilax, like almost all the species in the Dune series, are not aliens but in fact another branch of humanity, patriarchal in nature and focused on altering their evolution by genetic manipulation. Their social stratum is essentially twofold, the ruling Tleilaxu masters and their face dancer counterparts, who are essentially slaves and tools of war and statecraft to the Tleilaxu. In addition, the Bene Tleilax have a ruling council made up of masters known as Mashiks, who in turn have a leader known as a Mahai, and acts as an Abdul to the Tleilaxu people. The face dancers were initially created for entertainment, but over the years their ability to mimic has led to more Machiavellian uses. When talking to Farouk, a Fremen involved in the conspiracy against Paul and his family, Skytail reveals that he had toured as a part of a troop on Naraj, the same world that Farouk had fought in during Moadib's Jihad. Skytail informs Farok that he is indeed a face dancer, and seems to have a resemblance to Duncan Idaho at this point, who Farok had once known. Farok asks Skytail if face dancers are really men, to which he replies that they are Jadaka hermaphrodites, and able to be either sex at will. After Skytail murders Farok and his blind son, he walks out of the room with the drugged daughter of Othin, one of Paul's former Feda king his intent to kill Othim's daughter and take her form in order to gain access to Paul. The conversation with Farok also reveals a little of the Tylaxu technologies and how they are perceived by the peoples of the Imperium. The Tylaxu are able to create technological replacements for lost biological organs such as eyes. Farok reveals to Skytail much of his reasoning for joining the plot against Moadib a great deal of which revolves around his experiences on Naraj, where his son was blinded by a stone burner. Farok offers to buy artificial eyes from the Tleilaxu for his son, but he refuses, telling his father of his distrust of such devices which are metal and he is flesh, and that such a union must be sinful, a contrivance left over from the prohibitions of the Butlerian Jihad. Skytail, although a clever and talented face dancer, is aware of the limitations of his mimicry, knowing a well trained individual can sometimes spot a face dancer. When he presents himself to Paul in the form of Othim's daughter, Lichna, Skytail is able to fool Chani but not the Emperor himself. Paul nodded. He saw how Chani had been fooled. The tomber of voice everything reproduced with exactitude, had it not been for his own Bene Gesserit training in voice and for the web of Tao in which oracular vision enfolded him, this face dancer disguise might have gulled even him. Training exposed certain discrepancies. The girl was older than her known years. Too much control tuned the vocal cords. Set of neck and shoulders missed by a fraction the subtle hauteur of Fremen poise. But there were niceties too. The rich robe had been patched to betray actual status, and the features were beautifully exact. They spoke a certain sympathy of this face dancer for the role being played. The Tleilaxu face dancers themselves progress in an evolutionary manner throughout the series, and as they do so, their talents at mimicry over the thousands of years 
have become increasingly harder to detect. By the time of the God Emperor, some three and a half thousand years after the rule of Paul, the Bene Gesserit state that the face dancers of the Tleilaxu are still mules despite all efforts to change that condition. They also curiously mention that the Tleilaxu have sent envoys to the Bene Gesserit with the intention of embarking on a joint venture to produce a parthenogenic, female only society that has no need for males. Leto II himself refers to them as mules, stating that they are closer to a colony organism, and when discussing this with Duncan Idaho, he mentions that this is a choice they made for and by themselves. The face dancers use their abilities in God Emperor of Dune to take over and copy almost everyone in the Ixian embassy on Arrakis, as a prelude to an assassination attempt on Leto II. The Bene Gesserit are alerted to this attempt and try to warn the God Emperor, and when the face dancers finally attack, they all change into the form of Duncan Idaho in an attempt at confusion, as Idaho is the only male in the God Emperor's army commanding the fish speakers. Leto finds the attack amusing, though wonders how his fish speakers will protect the real Duncan Idaho, only to discover that having mimicked Duncan perfectly, including his black commander's uniform, Duncan has stripped naked in order to be correctly identified by his own forces. Leto sees the attack as inept, stating that some 500 years previous, the Tleilaxu would have been more daring and intelligent, finding it funny that for all their planning, their endeavour was foiled by one man simply taking his clothes off. Oddly enough, after having the Tleilaxu ambassador publicly flogged, Leto has the surviving face dancers, despite their obvious terror, perform for him in what is described as a parody of how Moadib's legions spread throughout the galaxy. With the death and metamorphosis of Leto II, the Dune series moves to its final two books, sometimes referred to as the Bene Gesserit books. Approximately 1500 years have passed since the death of Leto II, and the Empire is a vastly changed place, with the old political groups from before Moadib's empire returning to fill the power vacuum. After the death of Leto II, humanity goes into what is known as the Famine Times, which then lead directly to the Scattering, part of the plan of the Golden Path. While many citizens of the old Imperium remain, large groups of humanity have left going far beyond the Empire of a Thousand Worlds. At this time, the Bene Tleilax are once again amongst the dominant forces of the political power plays that resonate throughout the Imperium. They begin to make moves against the various other powers in the universe, the Ixians, the Fish Speakers, and the Bene Gesserit, their intent to compromise these groups' leadership with new and improved face dancers. Within the last two volumes of the Dune series, new mysteries arise regarding the nature of the Tleilaxu. The first is to do with how they are viewed by other species, and we discover that this is a self propagated means of propaganda a meme designed to disguise the Tleilaxu's true nature. The principal Tleilaxu master, or Mahai, in these novels is Tylwith Mwaf, and he reveals this when interrogating a fish speaker captive. The vile, detestable, dirty Tleilaxu. The stupid Tleilaxu. The predictable Tleilaxu. The impetuous Tleilaxu. Even the prophet's minions had fallen prey to this myth. A captive fish speaker had stood in this very room and shouted at a Tleilaxu master, Long pretense creates a reality, you are truly vile. So they had killed her, and the prophet did nothing. How little all of those alien worlds and peoples understood Tleilaxu restraint. The Tleilaxu's agenda is also associated with their religious outlook which together with their actual physical and sexual nature is kept a closely guarded secret. It is eventually with their knowledge of religions via the Missionaria Protectiva that the Bene Gesserit are able to discover this and begin their usual manipulations through established religious belief systems. Although the Bene Gesserit use religion as a political tool via their Panoplia Profecticus, they do however reveal to Miles Tegg, 
that they themselves follow one Zen Sunni ritual, namely that of the spice agony. In discussion with his fellow counsellors, Waf notes that all of them were reflecting on their Sufi origins, recalling the great belief in the Zen Sunni ecumenism that had spawned the Bene Tleilax. The Bene Tleilax are therefore guided in all that they do, including the genetic and sexual alterations they have gone through, in order to carry out the divine will of the Prophet, whom they see as being represented in Leto II and the renewed sandworms of Arrakis that are his legacy. Like the Kwisatz Haderach breeding program of the Bene Gesserit, the Tleilaxu's creation of the face dancers also falls prey to an unconsidered random element. The face dancers who have been developed genetically and improved upon over the millennia to exactly mimic their prey are perfected to such a degree where their mimicry is too complete. The Tleilaxu knowing that earlier forms of face dancer are detectable by those with prescient ability, prana bindu training, and especially by the Bene Gesserit, seek to improve the mimicry of the face dancers to perfection going as far as calling their mastery of the genetic language as the language of God. These face dancers are used to secure positions of authority amongst the fish speakers and the Ixians, effectively bringing them under control of the Tleilaxu. Like all technologies in the Dune universe, whether they are biological or mechanical, as they evolve so too does the required technological response or countermeasure. The Bene Gesserit discovers that some of the new face dancers are capable of not just mimicking another person, but of taking the memories from such a person even after death. This is not mind reading, but a technique the face dancers use known as imprinting. The response to this new threat is the use of share, another interesting drug in Herbert's Dune universe whose purpose is to prevent such an action from being taken. However, the new face dancers with their perfection of their mimicry ultimately represent a form of biotechnological hubris to the Tleilaxu. The genetic engineering of the face dancers by the Tleilaxu to perfect their mimicry is untested over lengthy periods. This echoes Herbert's belief of the need to look at human endeavours in the long term, as is also examined in the ecological themes of the Dune series. At the beginning of Heretics of Dune, the Bene Tleilax are once again in a position of prominent political power, and are ready to commence their plans for supremacy, using the new face dancers to take over prominent individuals within their opposing factions. The face dancers who have taken over such individuals have often been operating away from the guidance of a Tleilaxu master. This has resulted in the face dancers copying an individual to the point of complete mimesis, thus behaving in such a manner that there is no real discernible difference. To that extent, the Bene Tleilax masters have effectively lost control of what could be seen as their most lucrative technological advantage in the power plays taking place at that time. As a result perhaps of Herbert's attitudes to reliance and dependency displayed throughout the themes of the Dune series, the Bene Tleilax have all but fallen by the time of the events of Chapter House Dune with only one of their masters having survived and now in Bene Gesserit custody. This individual is the Tleilaxu master Skytail, who is a gola of the face dancer that was prominent in the conspiracy against Paul Atreides and his family in Dune Messiah. Skytail alone contains the genetic secrets of the Bene Tleilax hidden within a null entropy tube, surgically secreted inside his chest. Within this tube lies the genetic material capable of reconstructing his race, face dancers and Tleilaxu masters alike, as well as the genetic material of a number of powerful individuals. Each master had carried this resource, a null entropy capsule preserving the seed cells of a multitude, fellow masters of the central kale, face dancers, technical specialists and others he knew would be attractive to the women of Shaitan and to many weakling Pawinda. Paul Atreides and his beloved Chani were there. Oh what that had cost in searching garments of the dead for random cells. The original Duncan Idaho was there with other Atreides minions. The Mentat, Thufur Howitt, Gurney Halleck, 
the Fremen Naib Stilgar. Enough potential servants and slaves to people a Tleilaxu universe. The prize of prizes in the Null Entropy Tube, the ones he longed to bring into existence, made him catch his breath when he thought of them. Perfect face dancers. Perfect mimics. Perfect recorders of a victim's persona. Capable of deceiving even the witches of the Bene Gesserit. Not even Cher could prevent them from capturing the mind of another. The tube he thought of as his ultimate bargaining power. From this point on, Skytail remains a prisoner for his own protection on board the no-ship that the Bene Gesserit used to hide their new Duncan Idaho Gola and the captured honoured Matre Mirbella, who has been sexually imprinted by Duncan Idaho. It is Skytail's hope to one day recreate his people, and ultimately is forced to give up the secrets of the mysterious Tleilaxu axolotl tanks to the Bene Gesserit. The axolotl tanks are the other major technological innovation of the Bene Tleilax, and as with their genetically created face dancers, goes through a changing evolutionary process over the thousands of years from their apparent first use. Axlotl tanks are fundamentally linked to the creation of Golas in the Dune series, and again is an important technology throughout, remaining a focal point for one of the more interesting mysteries in the novels, why there are apparently no Tleilaxu females. The technologies involved also continue to evolve throughout the Dune series, and are products of both the Butlerian Jihad and later the prescriptions of Leto II. The first Gola in the Dune series is the character of Piter de Vries, the Baron Harkonnen's twisted mentat. However, the first proper use of a Gola is by the conspiracy against Paul in Dune Messiah, with the hate Gola, the first reincarnation of Duncan Idaho. The Guild has decided to present Paul with the gift of hate, whom they hope to use against the Emperor in a manner that is only revealed by the true machinations of the Tleilaxu plot. This is part of an altogether different agenda from the rest of their co-conspirators. Having the guild present the Gola rather than their own ambassadors is part of their plot, and intended to divert blame when the Gola's true purpose is revealed. The Gola technology is essentially a clone created from a dead individual's cells, which retains no memories of the dead person from whose DNA it has been created. Golas do not emerge as fully grown adults, and are trained during the process of their creation in any number of ways. However, the first Duncan Idaho Gola, Hate, must have been developed using some kind of accelerated growth, considering the time passed from the moment of his death to his arrival in the court of Moadib. Duncan Idaho was one of Paul's father's most trusted men, and trained as a swordmaster from the schools on Ginaz another one of the physical mental training schools created in the aftermath of the Butlerian Jihad. Idaho was killed fighting off Shaddam IV's Sardaukar on Arrakis, and due to the fact that he was able to kill so many of the Emperor's crack troops single-handed, a Sardaukar officer took his body and sold it to the Tleilaxu, recognising perhaps its genetic worth. The Tleilaxu were then able to create their first Idaho Gola in one of their axolotl tanks, and in this case, they trained Hate, as he became known, in Zen Sunni philosophy and as a mentat. The first Idaho Gola has none of his original memories from his actual life, and this is common for Golas at this point in the Dune timeline. He also differs from later Golas by having metal Tleilaxu eyes. The Hate Gola is sold to the Guild, who then in turn offers him as a gift to Paul when he is Emperor. The purpose of the Idaho Gola from the Tleilaxu point of view is to continually weaken Paul's strength of mind and to act as almost a psychic poison, to whittle away at Paul's resolve. The conspirators, using Paul's wife Irulan, have been slowly poisoning his concubine Chani with a contraceptive toxin in order to prevent her from giving birth to an heir. The members of the conspiracy seek to control Paul and whatever dynasty he creates through his bloodline, but their attempts ultimately fail. Chani realises that she has been poisoned and returns to the old ways of the Fremen, living on a traditional diet. She ultimately conceives, but the diet 
heavily laced with melange and in combination with the poisons she has taken, accelerate her pregnancy in a dangerous fashion which is ultimately fatal to her. However, at the critical moment, the Trilaxu set the true purpose of their plan in motion, once again showing Herbert's love for complexity and the recurring plans within plans within plans motif that is much a part of the Byzantine intrigues of the Dune series. At the end of Dune Messiah, Chani gives birth to twins, Leto II and Ganema, but dies shortly afterwards as a result of the poison she has ingested. Paul, who is physically blind at this point, though still has his prescient vision, is overcome with grief. He is confronted by Skytail, who has through the dwarf Bijaz passed on the commands to Duncan Idaho that had been hypnotically imprinted during his creation in the Axlotl tanks. The mental trauma of being put in a position of killing his former master creates a situation where Duncan Idaho's true personality returns, leaving hate behind and once again serving Paul as his loyal swordmaster. Skytail's offer to Paul, given precisely at the time when he is grief stricken, is to create a gola of his dead concubine, Chani. Skytail threatens killing the newborn children, and Paul, who is blind, is lent the prescient sight of the baby Leto II, who is born fully aware and is able to finally kill the face dancer. This, however, was not the full extent of the plan, and when Bijaz arrives, the dwarf reveals that the true intent was to determine whether or not Agola could have its original personality and memories fully restored. Hate as a mere physical copy of the former Atreides swordsmaster would not have been enough to entice Paul in his grief to agree to such a bargain, but a fully restored Duncan Idaho is the bait of the real trap, showing Paul right in front of him true proof that he can have his dead love restored to him. Fearing he may succumb, he asks Duncan to kill Bijaz before his grief overwhelms him and he can resist their offer no longer. The Hate Gola is the first of many such reincarnations of Duncan Idaho, this one dying at the hand of Stilgard to provoke him into action against Alia during the events in Children of Dune. However, the Duncan Idaho Golas are continually reincarnated by the Tleilaxu at the behest of Leto II, who uses Duncan as a boon companion, commander of his armies, and occasional stud for his breeding programme. Each time a Gola is created, its memories must be restored by a traumatic process akin to the one which Hate went through. As such, this strongly echoes George Bernard Shaw's summation of Samuel Butler's ideas of the latency of memory and its re emergence through associated ideas of the collective unconscious. By the time of the events in God Emperor of Dune, there have been numerous incarnations of the Duncan Idaho Golas, and although the true number is not clear, after the death of the present Duncan Idaho in an assassination attempt on the God Emperor, Leto II reveals that 19 Duncans died what people usually refer to as natural deaths. It is the qualities of Duncan Idaho that the Atreides have always loved in him, that causes the God Emperor to have one constantly at his side. Duncan was a handsome man, a highly skilled soldier and fanatically loyal to the Atreides, but it is one particular trait that Leto II is interested in, and that is his rebellious streak. Each time a new Duncan Idaho is delivered to the God Emperor by the Bene Tleilax, a period of transition and acclimatization is required, as each of these Golas has only memories of their life and death some three and a half thousand years ago. At this point the memories of the Golas are not cumulative, and they are often disturbed by the degree of change and amount of time that has passed since they were last alive. They also have to adjust to the God Emperor himself, who resembles a giant worm more than he does a man. Leto II often speaks to the Idaho Golas initially as either his father Paul or his grandfather Leto I, to provide some sense of familiarity to the Atreides. It is ultimately Duncan's loyalty to the Atreides family that the God Emperor relies upon to bring each Gola into his service. It is the God Emperor's intent to breed Duncan with Siona, the daughter of Maneo, his major domo, and an Atreides Skyon. 
Siona is essentially the end result of Leto II's breeding programme and has been bred to have a genetic trait that allows her to remain hidden from those with prescient abilities. All of Siona and Duncan's descendants will also have this ability, providing a genetic form of protection that is necessary for the survival of humanity and a part of Leto II's golden path. In the final two books of Herbert's Dune series, the focus shifts to the Bene Gesserit, and it is they who have taken over the remnants of Leto II's breeding programme, in addition to continuing to procure Duncan Idaho Golas from the Bene Tleilax. The Duncan Idaho of this period has been altered to some hidden purpose by the Tleilaxu within their axolotl tanks. This hidden ability is to be able to resist the sexual imprinting techniques used by the Bene Gesserit and their dark counterparts who have returned from the scattering, the Honoured Matres. During an attempt at sexual imprinting by an Honoured Matre called Mirbella, Duncan is able to turn this back upon her, the result being to sexually imprint her to him. This imprinting is essentially a form of sexual enslavement and dependency on the imprinter by the imprinted, and as such is the main tool used by the formidable Honoured Matres to enslave the male population. The additional side effect of the attempt at sexually imprinting Duncan Idaho is to release the cumulative store of memories from all his previous incarnations, as Golas throughout the millennia, essentially another form of other memory akin to that of the male-focused Kwisatz Haderachs and the female-focused Bene Gesserit. The essential difference is that Duncan Idaho's memories are personal, rather than being a true collective unconscious-like other memory. As revealed in the completion of the Dune series by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, Duncan Idaho is revealed to be the ultimate Kwisatz Satarak, and I shall touch upon this later in this chapter. The technology which creates him however is the Tleilaxu axolotl tanks, and these machines also develop one final evolutionary change. In Heretics of Dune, axolotl tanks are described as being a Tleilaxu device for reproducing a living human being from the cells of a cadaver. But due to the stranglehold on the universe's most desired and essential commodity, the Bene Tleilax have long been working on a means to produce artificial melange. With this shift of use in their secret technology, for every milligram of melange produced on Rakus, the Bene Tleilax tanks produced long tons, providing the Tleilaxu with a powerful economic and political advantage over the other prominent power groups. With real melange on Rakus being quite the scarce commodity, as it had been since the times of Leto II, it is now the Tleilaxu who, albeit briefly, are able to exercise what Herbert called hydraulic despotism, especially over the Guild and the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. The creation of the Duncan Idaho Golas for the Bene Gesserit comes at a high price too, with the Tleilaxu forcing them to pay each time in large quantities of melange, even when they as a people now have no real need for it. The Bene Gesserit's Bashar, Miles Teg, is easily able to deduce the reasoning behind this. And the Tleilaxu. They have decanted Duncan Idaho Golas from their axolotl tanks for millennia, even after the death of the tyrant. The Tleilaxu had sold this Gola to the Sisterhood twelve times, and the Sisterhood had paid in the hardest currency, melange from their own precious stores. Why did the Tleilaxu accept in payment something they produced so copiously? Obvious. To deplete the Sisterhood's supplies, a special form of greed there, the Tleilaxu were buying supremacy. A par game. With the eventual destruction of Rakus, and the last surviving worm on board the no ship which holds Duncan Idaho, Mirbella, and Skytail, it is through the last known surviving member of the Tleilaxu that the secret to the creation of Melange remains, hidden in the null entropy tube buried in his chest. The Tleilaxu's technological tools are totally based around the science of genetics, whereas the Ixians are more focused on mechanical technologies which often come close to violating the tenets of the Great Convention and the lessons learned from the Butlerian Jihad. Both sets of technologies are what we could consider mimetic, in that their ideas and concepts evolve in a similar way to biological evolution, 
And in the case of the Tleilaxu, have completely altered the genetic makeup of a people, creating a different and almost alien species of human being that has to a certain extent a religious genetic case system imposed upon their own society. The Ixian technologies evolve as a response to the results of the Kwisatz Haderach breeding program, which in turn see the god emperor complete his own breeding program in Siona, creating a human who can hide from prescience in the same way as an Ixian no-ship. Towards the end of events of Chapter House Dune, the Ixian civilization is in decline. The Bene Gesserit Mother Superior Odrad, sensing that no matter the outcome of our contest, Ix is dying. Witness. No great Ixian innovations in centuries. The Ixian culture is technologically speaking the one social element of the Dune universe that flourishes under the rule of the God Emperor. Although Leto II in his role as the ultimate predator continues to impose the prescriptions on technology upon the general population, and most specifically those focused on machine intelligence, this is done to help mankind in their struggle to survive as part of the Golden Path. At the heart of the Golden Path is natural selection imposed by political force and guided perfectly by the God Emperor's prescience, which is virtually inescapable. While most of the human societies of the Imperium suffer under his rule to a greater or lesser degree, the Ixians enjoy a relatively safe time as they are the sole supplier of the technological needs of the God Emperor. These technological innovations are necessary for the greater part to implement the lessons of the Golden Path that Leto II has foreseen after his four deaths, and to facilitate the passing on of the God Emperor's ideas to the generations that come after his rule. As a result, it is the God Emperor himself who spurs the innovations of the Ixians that are so fundamental to their growth as a technological society, and their decline is seemingly inevitable in the period during and after the scattering, as they have not suffered greatly under the yoke of the God Emperor's tyrannical rule. As a result, their innovations and ability to adapt stagnate, unlike the other human societies that have suffered greatly at the hands of the God Emperor yet have emerged after his three and a half thousand year rule, stronger than before. The Bene Tleilax have all but been destroyed by the Honoured Matres, their own hubris coming from such a degree of dependency on a technology that has ultimately failed them, and brought their race to a point where individuals maintain a degree of immortality through the Gola process, but ultimately would seem to have a very limited gene pool to draw upon. It is the threat of their face dancers and their ability to embed a genetic weapon in individuals such as Duncan Idaho that ultimately caused the Honoured Matres to destroy their planet in a genocidal rage. In a universe where mankind has accelerated its own evolution based upon the spur that was the Butlerian Jihad, Herbert is clearly making a statement on the dangers of dependency upon technology, especially when linked to evolution. The crutch that was removed by the Butlerian Jihad has been taken up by both these races despite the prescriptions and dangers of technology apparent from the historical lessons learned by it. Taking the analogy further, by taking up this metaphorical crutch once again, both the Tleilaxu and the Ixians, in an attempt to run before they can walk, have ultimately crippled their development to the point of extinction in a universe where everyone else has been learning to slowly walk again. <laughs>